Witajcie, z tej strony Michał Oleszczyk, Spoilermaster, podcast do słuchania po seansie. To jest odcinek specjalny podcastu, odcinek nadliczbowy, odcinek, w którym rozmawiam z autorem książki, która 28 lutego roku 2024 pojawia się na polskim rynku wydawniczym. Oscarowe wojny. Historia Hollywood pisana złotem, potem i łzami to nowa i znakomita książka Michaela Schulmana, autora piszącego o kinie dla czasopisma The New Yorker, którą w Polsce wydało wydawnictwo Marginesy w świetnym polskim przykładzie Jana Dzierzgowskiego. Spoiler Master objął patronat medialny nad tą naprawdę znakomitą pozycją, która jest niekonwencjonalną historią Oscarów od ich poczęcia aż do teraz, opowiedzianą poprzez kluczowe lata, poprzez kluczowe dla tej nagrody lata, kiedy napięcia wokół nagród w interesujący sposób eskalowały i Michael Schulman jako kronikarz owych napięć daje nam na 600 ponad stronicach wspaniałej prozy, Historię tej nagrody, ale także historię Ameryki, historię popularnej kultury, historię gwiazd, talentów i oczywiście także słynnych oskarowych pominięć. Dzięki uprzejmości wydawnictwa Marginesy udało mi się porozmawiać z Michaelem Schulmanem i za chwilę ta rozmowa dla Was w Spoiler Masterze. Powtarzam, książka w księgarniach od 28 lutego roku 2024. Zapraszam na rozmowę. And I'm joined by Michael Schulman. Hello, Michael. Hi, thanks for having me. Uh, it's uh, fantastic to talk to you. Uh, Michael is a staff writer for The New Yorker, and it so happens that his latest book, uh, which was published in the States uh, last year, almost exactly one year ago, in February 2023, uh, a book with an epic title, uh, worthy of Cecil B. DeMille, I would say, Oscar Wars, A History of Hollywood in Gold, Sweat and Tears, is getting its Polish edition. On the 28th of February, Wydawnictwo Marginesy is publishing a wonderful Polish translation by Jan Dzierzgowski. I want to stress this because I actually read the book in English when it first appeared, but now I reread parts of it in Jan's translation and it's absolutely top-notch. So, Michael, your prose is in a very good hands. Uh, oh, good. You know, I heard from him when he was translating. He had some questions for me. There were one or two, like, puns that did not work in Polish and he wanted my permission to butts with them a little bit, which I gladly gave. But it was it was so nice to hear from him and that he was so sensitive with the translation. Oh, that's wonderful. He's really... Uh, uh, he's really good at uh, at this. One of the best translators working in Poland today, Michael. I I am thrilled to talk to you. I've been following your writing for for years, and I have to say that uh, this book particularly, um, I want to congratulate on because uh, I think it's both lively, it's uh, epic, and I do think that it uh, is one of the uh, indispensable book books for any Oscar. Uh, buffs out there it will find its way on oscar buff uh, bookshelves you know alongside such classics as uh, inside oscar for example uh, by wiley and bona it's simply a wonderful work so thank you so much for uh, for writing it um, and i wanted to start with the dedication you dedicate the book uh, to your parents uh, i wanted to ask about your experience of watching uh, the oscar ceremony when you were a child, when did it start for you? Was it a family watching or was it more of a solitary fascination on your part? When did it start for you? I remember it so clearly. Uh, it, I was 11, I guess. It was the 1993 Oscars. And I remember because those were the years of the Billy Crystal opening medley. And uh, I thought they were so funny. I knew Billy Crystal from, you know, probably City Slickers and throw mom off the train, stuff like that. So I loved seeing him, but I didn't understand any of the jokes because I was too young to see any of those movies. You know, it was like Unforgiven and the crying game. You know, I was 11. I had no idea. You know, he goes into the audience and sings to Clint Eastwood about shooting everyone in, in Unforgiven because he's the star. And um, 
I just loved it. I thought it was so funny. And I loved this idea that all these people who were in movies all got together in a place called Hollywood and people won and lost like a game, you know, it, it, in, a, in a way it was so accessible and yet so unfamiliar to me. And I think I just, my parents let me stay up. I don't know for the whole show, but certainly enough to see the beginning. Um, and I just kept watching them. Right, right, right. This is uncanny because this is also the first Oscar show that I watched at exactly the same ceremony. Although, oh my God. Yes, 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 that was the first one that I watched. Uh, although you need to know that um, uh, Oscars were never um, broadcast live in Poland until 19, before 1998 uh, mm. when first live broadcast happened of course uh, that was uh, uh, middle of the night uh, because of the time the time difference but uh, between 1991 and 1997 i guess uh, there were those uh, edited shows you know it was an hour and a half uh, yeah yeah it was an edited version and it was broadcast uh, a day or two later after the ceremony and this was the first one that i watched in its entirety and the first one i taped as well because then i you know rewatched it many times so i, I do remember it very well uh, especially you know marisa tomei winning for uh, my cousin uh, vinny but there were so many oh was that that year oh my gosh <laughs> uh, that, was... see i loved my cousin vinny so maybe that was one of the only awards that i you know understood who was winning I had no idea that it was it was so controversial because you remember people kept saying after that that you know it was the wrong name um you know I think I think it was Jack Palance who must have given to her and people thought oh she couldn't have won for that part he you know he's old he read the wrong name but no she was wonderful in my cousin Vinny and uh you know to hell with anyone who thought she didn't deserve it Absolutely. It remains, actually, it remains uh, probably my favorite Oscar moment uh, as far as just the genuine uh, joy of the winner, you know, because the, she was pitted against, uh, you know, Vanessa Redgrave and Emma Thompson and all those, John Plowright, you know, all those very haughty, mostly British actresses, if I remember. And here she was winning for, you know, playing a daughter of the auto mechanic from New Jersey, you know, so it was... Uh, <laughs> That's my how... biological clock is ticking like this <laughs> so good and you know there's so it's so rare that a comedic performance wins at the oscars so i'm kind of always happy when one of them does but then people start to try to try to call it into doubt and you know i think when um when the la la land and moonlight mix-up happened and you immediately saw all these people in headsets running on the stage to correct the record it kind of vindicated um Marissa Tomei, because they don't just let a, the wrong winner stand if they read it wrong like that. That obviously didn't happen with her. Absolutely. I, I always uh, felt angry when I when I read those uh, conspiracy theories being spread, especially because the uh, the performance is simply so wonderful. It totally warranted the, the award. Um, I wanted to ask you about the the book itself because it's it, it's a big book. It's all you know. It covers a, a lot of uh, ground, and you focus on uh, pivotal moments, on pivotal years in uh, in the history of the Oscars, and you touch upon some really big historical issues like like the war, like uh, counterculture blacklist you know car current uh, uh, controversies uh, that are uh, pertaining to the oscars my first question will be how did you prepare to write the book and how did you select those pivotal years that then you uh, researched and and uh, wrote about in the book right the idea for the book from the beginning was to not do a book that went through every single year and gave a few pages to all 90 whatever years and said who won, who lost, you know, who the host was, what, you know, what jokes were told. Those books exist. You mentioned a really good one before, Inside Oscar by uh, Wiley and Bona. And I have a bunch of those books on my shelf, but they, they all predate Wikipedia. So we kind of don't need that sort of record keeping book anymore. What I wanted to do was choose just about a dozen really important, pivotal, juicy years and dive really deep into them and almost make them like New Yorker features where they're character driven, detail driven, and they tell you something about the era. So 
this was actually a really fun part. I went, you know, I, I went, I read that Inside Oscar book, which has like 10 pages on every single year going up to, you know, the 80s, I think. And I tried to pick out the ones that would, that I felt told something, a bigger story. And I basically had three criteria. One, I wanted to cover all different decades. So I didn't want to have, you know, five chapters set in the 70s. Um, and so I really tried to spread them out. Number two, I didn't, I, I didn't want the movies or the people to be too obscure. So I tried to look for years where the, the contenders still have some relevance. And then most importantly, number three, I looked for years that told some bigger story about the evolution of Hollywood or the evolution of the Oscars themselves or the evolution of culture. So as an example, you know, I needed something in the 1940s, which is a huge decade for Hollywood, obviously. There's so many classics. So what do you do? Do you do the, you know, the year the Casablanca one? Do you do what, you know? And um, what I spotted in 1942 was that there were three incredible things happening at the same time. One, it was the year that Citizen Kane lost all but one Oscar, which is one of the you know, biggest mistakes in Oscar history. How did that happen? And of course, there's so much drama around the making of Citizen Kane. Number two, it was two and a half months after Pearl Harbor. And so all of Hollywood was grappling with uh, America entering the war. And at the Academy, Betty Davis was the president of the Academy and quit in a blaze of glory because they wanted to cancel the show. And then lastly, <laughs> um, the best actress category contained two sisters who hated each other in the same category, Olivia de Havilland and Joan Fontaine. And so what I, what's the thread that ties those things all together is war, you know, the war between citizen Kane between um, Orson Welles and uh, William Randolph Hearst, the war, uh, you know, the, the actual war, World War II and the war of the sisters. And so that chapter is called war. <laughs> So um, that's kind of how I went through the history. And, um, you know, there were certain things that I changed along the way. But basically, as I as I went, it kind of revealed itself to me what stories I wanted to tell. Mm -hmm. That's that's great. I also when you look even on the at the list of uh, best picture winners over the years, there are those moments in which you can almost uh, see the seismic shift happening you know year to year for me always the, you know my favorite is uh those two years when uh you know oliver wins best picture and next year night night cowboy wins sorry midnight cowboy so th th yeah absolutely no i know. think um yeah so so i always wanted i always knew i was going to have a big chapter on um the moonlight la la land envelope mix up in the wake of Oscars So White, because I was there. That was my first year going to the Oscars. And I covered that year for The New Yorker and thought this tells a big story about race in America, about the shifting politics of that year, it was the year of the, you know, tr the Trump versus Clinton election. And there was obviously a lot going on and it has this insane uh, Hollywood twist ending of this freak envelope mix up. And um, but I also thought that the triumph of Moonlight was one of those Oscar wins that really kicks the awards into the future and or into the present, I should say. Like it, 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 it's not just um, a great movie; it's it redefined what a Best Picture winner could look like. And I think that the year of Midnight Cowboy, in nineteen seventy, was very similar. And there were a lot of echoes between those two years. Um, they were both years where the president of the Academy was trying to update the membership to to keep up with the times. In 2017, it was, in 2016, it was Cheryl Boone Isaacs trying to diversify and bringing in more people of color and younger people, more women, more international members. In 1970, it was Gregory Peck, who was the president of the Academy and was trying to bring in uh, the sort of youth quake generation, the counterculture, people like Dennis Hopper and Dustin Hoffman. So, um, so I, I, I liked the idea that the chapters can all be read individually, but they also sort of echo with each other across the ages. 
Uh, they definitely do. And I also am grateful uh, to you for the 2017 uh, uh, chapter because uh, uh, for, for for a very mundane reason, you you so lucidly explain just exactly what happened, you know, with the envelope. It's uh, because I everybody, know, yeah. everybody just, you know, sort of accepted the, the broad term mix up, but you actually, you know, take us step by step uh, and uh, explain uh, what happened, you know, and what went uh, wrong. So oh, was, I know. And there, there's I will say, for, you know, there are there are details in there that were not previously known. And I, I wanted to get down to the level of like, what were the exact hand motions that made this happen, this this mistake? And I, you know, reported it very deeply and, and found out. So this is the part of the book that really felt like, you know, investigative uh, reporting at its uh, at its best. I uh, I'm partial to two um, chapters, uh, especially uh, the 1951 one, uh, where we have uh, All About Eve and uh, Sunset Boulevard, and uh, the, the the big duel, I guess, between um, Beth Davis and uh, Gloria Swanson, and the 1989 one, where you cover the Alan Carr, the infamous uh, Alan Carr uh, opening uh, musical number. And, uh, you know, just uh, I would like you to comment on the 1951, because this duel between Davis and uh, Swanson is the stuff of Hollywood legends. You know, we have two yeah. divas vying for supremacy, somebody else winning. <laughs> uh, but but I, I wanted to ask you this question. Well, are we still in an era when where this kind of diva dueling is even possible or uh, is our notion of stardom simply uh, shifted to the point that we don't look at those uh, oh. clashes as, as uh, those you know mythical <laughs> that's an interesting question you know I, I, I that was one uh, year that I had in mind from the very very beginning it was almost the first one I thought of because I love best actress as a category um, and it often has this heightened quality to it where we we sort of we as a culture kind of like to pit women against each other and it sort of becomes its own kind of drama you know for for better or worse and that year just had this incredible stack of incredible iconic performances you know um somehow it was Betty Davis and Ann Baxter from All About Eve in the same category which is its own form of like caddy competition. I love that movie. Um, and then uh, Gloria Swanson in Sunset Boulevard, an absolutely, uh, I hate using the word iconic, but you know, that's what it is. And then the winner was Judy Holliday in Born Yesterday, which was also an, a very, very famous, important uh, performance and a wonderful performance. And um, I just thought it felt, it just felt instinctually juicy to me. Um, and so, I, and I wanted at least one chapter to be about a best actress race. And that just seemed like the one, uh, you know, both all about Eve and Sunset Boulevard are movies about actors and about show business. And they're very, very sort of acid about the industry that they portray. They're about women who worry that they're being pushed out because they're too old or too you know, basically over the hill and and they're fighting for their place. And that is an echo of the Oscar race. Now, I think that those women would say, well, we weren't fighting with each other. We weren't feuding with, you know, Gloria Swanson, especially she in her memoir says, no, I didn't. I didn't really care about the Oscar, about the competition, but everyone else wanted me to be, you know, wanted me to turn it into Norma Desmond. And I do think that's kind of how it still is, because, you know, this year, for instance, the best actress race is very stacked and it had you have sort of Lily Gladstone versus Emma, T Emma Stone, which I think is what the common wisdom is going to be one of those two, but also this incredible performance by Sandra Huller. And I don't think any of those women would say they're competing with each other. You know, they're all having a lovely time at each other, but in the in the in the sort of public imagination it's always like this heightened competition mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i i agree and uh, the funny thing is about to this year's competition and especially those names that you mentioned that i think 
that both American actresses that you mentioned uh, uh, gave performances that back in the day would be more associated with uh, risk-taking European films, uh, like mm. especially Stone and, and Poor Things. Uh, she does things in that film that, you know, take her very, very far from the conventional notions of American stardom. And Sandra Hüller, to me, actually plays almost like an old time Betty Davis type of uh, type of performance, like in the letter. For oh, example. yeah, so, that's a good like, point. It, this big uh, melodrama, it, it's a melodrama, really, you know, the, the anatomy of a fall. Yeah. Uh, or, I don't know, Susan Hayward. <laughs> One of those years, so it's it's a it's a fascinating. Uh, Can uh, you imagine Betty Davis and Anatomy of a Fall? <laughs> I can imagine uh, some <laughs> that would be letter. so great. <laughs> she would that then there would be no uh, question, you know, <laughs> did she do it or didn't she? <laughs> yeah, no, she did. Yeah, you're right. Actually, it probably wouldn't work. You would need someone a little bit softer, like I don't know, maybe an Olivia de Havilland. <laughs> yeah, somebody who couldn't kill with her look, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, she just glares at him and he falls out the window. <laughs> <laughs> but Sandra uh, Fuller is like tough, you know. She's like robust, and. She- I think she played it as if she didn't kill him, but the fact that you she just sort of has this imposing presence kind of kind of makes you wonder maybe she could have. She definitely physically could have pushed a man out of a window. And in the uh, you know strange serendipitous kind of way, the other movie that she stars in this year also supports this. This is you know right, yeah, like a Nazi. Uh, so that 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 adds to the coloring you know, of this yeah. character. I guess. Uh, but just two words about 1989, because, you know, I wasn't uh, that much aware of it beforehand, because since I mentioned, you know, in Poland, we only had the Oscars uh, broadcast from 1993 uh, upwards. So I never saw the um, 1989 ones until, of course, you know, YouTube came along. And this opening number uh, stage directed, produced, conceived <laughs> by, you know, in the mind of Alan Carr of the uh, can't stop the music fame and you know Greece fame. Yeah. <laughs> something to behold, something almost that I actually miss about the Oscars, you know, nowadays. Can you the imagine crazy over the top production yes. numbers? Yeah. Like well just uh, did you know uh, like with 1951 that this is the year that you really need to include because of just how fun actually no, I that did. was I, I I came to that one a little later. You know, I looked at the 80s and you know you have to do something from the 80s. But the Oscar winners from the 80s kind of bore me. Like, I don't really like a lot of them. Um, it, they're just kind of snoozy. Like, you know, Gandhi, Amadeus. They're kind of these, like, big, long, the last emperor. Nothing really grabbed out me. Africa. Out of Africa. Out, out of Africa. I mean, you know, this is not you know I'm a Meryl Streep fan, but, like, I just didn't want to write a whole chapter about, like, out of Africa winning. So I, what I realized is that the 80s chapter was not going to be about a race between movies. It was going to be about the ceremony and this infamous ceremony that's often called the worst Oscars ever, 1989. Um, for people who don't know it, it started with an 11-minute musical number that included Rob Lowe singing Proud Mary with a woman dressed as Snow White in a replica of the coconut uh, grove, the famous Hollywood uh, restaurant with dancing cocktail tables. It's like, it's like a fever dream. It's insane. It's so over the top and so campy and ridiculous. And, you know, a lot of, there, there are often articles online every, every couple of years about, you know, looking back at this, you know, horrible opening number, the worst Oscars ever. But what I found inside of that is almost a tragedy. This man, Alan Carr, who was a really um, sort of over-the-top flamboyant film producer, um, he dreamt his whole life of producing the Oscars and finally got his chance. And what he would do is just put his name in the press however he could. He would say, oh, my Oscars are going to be bigger and better and glitzier, more glamour, blah, 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 blah. And so every he just put his name on everything. And so when it went south, when it, when it was a disaster, everybody knew where to point their finger, which was at Alan Carr. And it ruined his career. It kind of ruined his life. He was completely ostracized in Hollywood. And um, 
to me, it's like an Icarus story. You know, he flew too close to the Oscar sun and plunged into the sea in his in his uh, one of his fabulous designer caftans. Um, and I I sort of felt like I needed to defend him a little bit. And if you you know, that's why I I, I sort of mentioned some of the other tacky production numbers from the eighties. Like, yeah, it was. 1989 was bad, but the whole decade was pretty tasteless and over the top. And I, it's sort of interesting to see why did this one get singled out? Why did this person get singled out and blamed? And why was his, why was one person's life ruined over a, a kind of tacky Oscar musical number? Yeah, I, I found it heart heartbreaking as well and so incisive on your part because basically you you clearly show uh, very truly, I think, that there was this um, underlying streak of homophobia to this uh, reaction. You know, here is here there, you know, an openly gay producer who is not shy about his quote unquote campy appreciation and love, love, genuine love of old Hollywood, of, uh, you know, the over the topness of all of that. And he's being, you know, ostracized, as you, as you said, almost for being, quote unquote, too gay and too... too yeah. Too you know, it's funny. I feel like if Alan Carr was working today, he would be Ryan Murphy. You know, there's the stuff that he was interested in is the stuff that Ryan Murphy was interested in. Actually, it's funny. I recently met Ryan Murphy because I went to the opening party for uh, the new series of, of Feud. And I was introduced to him and he was wearing a fabulous, like uh, glittering cape. And um, I was, I sort of like joked to him, oh, you should make the next season of Feud, uh, Alan Carr versus the Oscars. And he told me that uh, Ryan Murphy, he, at the time, he was a young entertainment reporter for uh, the Miami Herald. And he actually trailed Alan Carr uh, that year before the Oscars and got to know him a little bit. And I went back into the archives and I found one of Ryan Murphy's stories about Alan Carr preparing for the Oscars. I'm kicking myself that I didn't know that while I was writing the book because I would have interviewed him or at least mentioned it, um, that there was this like 23-year-old kid named Ryan Murphy who was in the mix there. But I also feel like Ryan Murphy's living, you know, like has the career that Alan Carr really, really would have liked to have, making like these, you know, mini series about you know, obscure show business stuff. I mean, how much would Alan Carr have loved to make Betty versus Joan or, you know, Truman Capote versus the Swans? That was totally his, his, his taste. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, and, you know, I, I'm really glad that this chapter is there because it simply honors uh, Carr's sensibility. And uh, as I mentioned, his genuine love of, of Hollywood. I think that we would be hard pressed today to find anyone, you know, among producers who, who, who knows their Hollywood history that well and who cherishes it, you know, that in in that genuine fashion. So, so that's something really that that I, I you know, I love about Carr, and uh, I wish that you know that that story had a different um, ending. Uh, I wanted to ask you about the unsung heroes about the Oscars because one of the most fascinating things about the book is that you, uh, you know, had access to archives and you unearthed some information that couldn't be found anywhere, you know, before. Uh, for example, when you write about co counterculture and its sort of clash with the Oscar, uh, the Oscars, uh, you mentioned Candice Bergen as this very apt. Um, socialite player who was trying to you know facilitate communication between different uh, generations of filmmakers uh, you know she wouldn't be the first person that i would associate you know with oscar history apart from her nominations but but here she is you know actually actively facilitating uh, a very difficult transitional moment in hollywood history uh, who you would say are the biggest unsung heroes of this ongoing uh, Oscar uh, saga. Well, it's it's funny that you mentioned Candice Bergen as an, as an unsung hero. You know, I think of her as such a, a star. Um, yeah. But she did play this like little role in nudging the Academy. This was 1969. And she was at the time, this very this sort of trendy it girl. Uh, you know, she was 23 or something. And she'd grown up in Hollywood. Her father was the famous ventriloquist Edgar Bergen. But she was also friends with people like Dennis Hopper, who was making Easy Rider. 
and um, she was part of this sort of hippie crowd. And when she watched the Oscars, she said she didn't recognize anyone her age. It felt so old and and um, and antiquated. And so she wrote a letter to Gregory Peck, who was the president at the time, and said, "You need to, you need to get some new blood." And he said, "Yes, please go ahead." Uh, you know, she she asked, "Can, can I recruit my friends?" To, you know, who are who are at the vanguard of cinema. And Gregory Peck, to his um, great credit, said, "Yes, pl please do go ahead." And and she brought in people like uh, Dennis Hopper and Peter Fonda and Dustin Hoffman, um, and kind of led the way. She was in the perfect position to sort of bridge the old Hollywood and the new Hollywood. And I loved this this sort of you know I found their letters between her and and Gregory Peck in the Academy Library, and there it's this reach across the generation gap, which was so fascinating to me and so unlikely. Um, and then I got the, uh, uh, I was so uh, grateful to be able to interview Candace Bergen for the book as well. Uh, this was, I was working on this part right at the beginning of the lockdown in 2020. And so she wrote back to me and said, well, we're all benched, so I might as well. And she got on the phone. Uh, she was hilarious. Um, unsung heroes. I mean, if you're talking about the Academy as an organization, you would definitely have to talk about, um, Margaret Herrick, who was, um, there starting in the thirties. Um, I, th I believe that her husband was first, was the, the fir first person, uh, of the two of them to be employed by the Academy. He was like the executive director or something. And she was a former librarian. And so she, volunteered to start an academy library just of film of books about film which if you think about it in the 30s there weren't a lot and they weren't they weren't easily findable and then she became uh you know the academy's librarian the academy's library is named after her now it's a wonderful place in beverly hills the margaret herrick library and eventually she became the executive director um after she had divorced uh her husband donald Gl gledhill and was really like, she was really running the, the show there for, for many decades through, you know, there, I also found a lot of letters between her and Gregory Peck, just figuring out Academy business. Um, so yeah, I think she, she was, she was someone who, uh, who I was happy to learn about. Mm. I, uh, I love those moments in the book and just for Candice Bergen, uh, sh I just, just, uh, some trivia, uh, in 1990, after communism fell in Poland, Polish public television bought first three sitcoms to American sitcoms to to be aired on 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 Polish uh, TV, and those three sitcoms were Bill Cosby Show, Alf, and Murphy Brown, and that that was the time when we became aware sort of of, of Candice Bergen, and she was very big in Poland. Oh my there. God, that's amazing! So like your first exposure to like an like an American career woman was Murphy Brown. Murphy Brown alongside Dynasty, which was, of course, both no. of them. <laughs> now we're talking. <laughs> and that was an interesting thing because we actually no. thought, that, uh, I remember it very well, we assumed that it's a realistic portrayal of, you know, how rich people no. <laughs> live. We didn't get the campy part of it. You know, we thought, oh, so this is how it is. Yeah. <laughs> it is what it, how it <laughs> Just a lot of ladies slapping each other <laughs> with big shoulder pads. Exactly. And uh, slinging themselves in the mud. Uh, Michael, three last uh, questions, uh, short ones. Uh, please tell me what is your favorite Oscar winner? I know it's such a difficult, but a moment that just is filled with joy. You enjoy maybe uh, looking at the clip of, you know, the winner just giving their speech and you feel that it's just exactly right that they're won at this point in their careers and uh, who would be the candidate? Okay, so my personal favorite Oscar speech ever is when Meryl Streep won for The Iron Lady, because oh. I love Meryl Streep's speeches. In fact, I used to be able to I used to be able to recite them all from memory, all of her award speeches because oh. they're so delicious and funny. Oh. And um, when she, so when she won for The Iron Lady in 2012, she starts the speech by going. Ah. When they called my name, it was like I could hear half of America going, oh, come on. Why? Her. Again. But whatever. <laughs> the and the title to your previous book, right? About exactly. Her. And so my first book was called Her Again, and it was about Meryl Streep. And it came from that Oscar speech. And the beginning of that book is about her, her winning that award. So 
I have to I have to go to that one. And then she launches into this really moving uh, speech where she singles out her husband, who is now, I guess, they've split up since. But, you know, it's lovely. <laughs> it's a lovely tribute to him. And um, and then her hair and makeup artist, who had been with her since uh, Sophie's Choice, uh, Roy Helland. And it's such a specific window into, like, this long collaboration she's had with this one guy. And we know how important, you know, the 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 hair and the and the and the look of the character is uh, for Meryl Streep. And I just I just think find it so moving. Uh, I I'm I'm glad to hear that. Uh, I think that you know knowing Meryl Streep probably maybe there will be one or more uh, two more speeches for you to memorize in the future. You know who knows? Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. Wait, what's uh, yours? Next time, uh, my is Marisa Tomei because you know it's. Mm. Uh, both the first Oscars that I ever watched, so it sort of etched itself in my memory a lot. And I, you know, back then I was 13, I wouldn't phrase it uh, that way, but there was something so genuinely unpretentious about her, you know, uh, so American mm. about her. I didn't know that she, back then I didn't know that she was pitched against those British actresses. I didn't know about that, uh, mm. but, but she was simply overjoyed. <laughs> and, I, and I still remember That's the a good one. Day. That they played, uh, you know, with <laughs> playing the car, you know, with positive traction or whatever that was. Ah, uh, the traction, yeah. <laughs> I just thought she was she was wonderful, I, I, and that 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 stayed with me. Um, a tougher question: your biggest the prosecution's shock... case does not hold water. Exactly. <laughs> Such a exactly. good movie. <laughs> with Joe Pesci looking on. Um. Your biggest Schadenfreude moment when you when somebody lost and you were sort of happy about it and you may you know be cautious with this but maybe you can take something with, from distant past. What, what was there a moment? No, no, no. I have an answer. I have an answer. My biggest Schadenfreude moment. I think it would have to be when Catherine Bigelow won Best Director for The Hurt Locker in 2010 because a couple things. First, mainly she beat her ex husband James Cameron. And this was 12 years after James Cameron gave that really cringy speech, I'm the king of the world for Titanic. He was back with Avatar, and yet he loses to his ex-wife for this little movie, The Hurt Locker. And that was just, there was something so delicious about that. And then, um, and then of course, she's the first woman to win Best Director. So it was this extra charge to it all. And I watched the clip again recently of her winning and it's so great because they bring out Barbara Streisand to give the award and she starts by saying this year for the first time it could be a woman <laughs> and so she clearly like you know it's like Barbara Streisand who was you know famously snubbed for directing and such a pioneer in, in, as a as a female director and then she opens the envelope and she said the time has come <laughs> And gives it to Catherine Bigelow. And then they walk off as the orchestra plays, I am woman, hear me roar. Uh, and you just see, you know, poor James Cameron in his seat. You know, uh, I, I, it's just so good. I uh, I agree. It's a fantastic moment. I, I, I recently just finished listening to 48 hours of Barbara Streisand's memoir on, uh, you know, Audible. <laughs> uh, it was a wonderful, ex wonderful experience. Also because it was so long and you can learn you know what she had for lunch in 1972 <laughs> it's so oh my god i haven't read it um or listened to it but i've read about it i've listened to interviews a friend of mine said it's 70 percent snacks yes but 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 i do recommend it i have to say one uh, one thing i um sped it up just a little bit because she reads it very very slowly and it's for me it's a little bit unnatural you know i like i like her when she's this fast talking lady like in you know, owl and the pussycat. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like what's, what's up, doc? Up. Yeah, you got to yeah. crank her up to what's up, doc speed. <laughs> yes, 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 and then it's 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 wonderful. Uh, she actually quotes a, a note that she got from Catherine Hepburn after after that famous uh, pie, uh, funny lady with uh, sorry, funny girl with um, lion in winter, and it's a very gracious note that she got from 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 Kate. So it's also a ni nice Oscar trivia. One last question, and this may be, I don't know if you have an answer for this. Um, 
Oscar quirks, and I will, I will, I will um, explain what I mean. You know, some Oscar wins are so etched into my memory that just, you know, you can wake me up in the middle of the night and, you know, say uh, something like, you know, uh, 1982, and I will be Gandhi, like Gandhi you know, because I simply <laughs> know them say it so well, like many Oscar buffs. So for years, I had like my PIN numbers for uh, credit cards or my, you know, door. Don't give out your PIN number. No, no, no. Well, <laughs> to you, I can give it like, you know. A couple of years ago, it was a combination of Pulp Fiction and uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Never mind. Simply those this days. This is already too much information. You should be not be not be revealing this to the scammers. They, they, they I, I changed it uh, by, by now. However, uh, you know those those little Oscar quirks. Do you, do you have them or like Oscar gadget that you have at home, like a napkin that you have from you know at Oscar gala, something that simply means a lot to you as an Oscar nerd that you are, because with this book, you proved that you are a wonderful Oscar historian, but you are also a true, uh, wonderful Oscar nerd at heart. So anything? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have I have a couple things. I actually have like a, a plastic Oscar statuette that I was awarded um, by the restaurant Joe Allen, which is in the, in the Broadway area in New York City. It's like, where everyone goes after Broadway shows. And they used to have their own award shows called the Joey Awards, where they would um, get the whole staff together and they give out awards for like best bartender, best dinner, best waiter in an evening, in a, in a, in, at dinner time, a best coat check. And um, I wrote a story about them for The New Yorker. And then the next year, they gave me an honorary award as for, for best wow. regular. <laughs> and the restaurant. So I have that here and I used to have it when I, I used to have it on my desk at the New Yorker. Um, and now we have like flexible desks or whatever. So I can't keep stuff there, but it's, it's up, you know, it's next to my desk. And I, I'm, I'm very, I'm very proud of this fake restaurant Oscar that I won. Oh, that's, that's wonderful. Unlikely as that sounds, I went once to uh, Joe Allen's in very, very strange, uh, wonderful uh, circumstances. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was in New York and I uh, summoned the courage and I emailed uh, Rex Reed because I always wanted to meet him. And he invited me to lunch uh, at Joe Allen's and we had uh, uh, we had lunch. I was, uh, at the time, I was interested in Pauline Kale and I wanted to know if he had any anecdotes about her. So he, he shared some uh, with me. But I do remember that at Joe Allen's, all the uh, posters on the wall are of famous flops, right? You need yes, to, yes. You need a flop they, yeah. to get in. Yeah, so... So famous was... Broadway flops. Um, yeah, that it's 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 a, a very famous place. That sounds fun. Did what did Rex Reed have to say about Pauline Kale? Did he like her? Uh, he, he he liked her. I, I do remember one thing that he mentioned that she was very loud during film screenings, uh, and she, that she reacted in a very loud way when she didn't like something. And uh, Rex, oh, really, like scowling. Like, uh, <laughs> I will quote. I will quote. He said. And then there were those orgasmic noises that she made you know, as she was watching movies. And he was not the only one who mentioned this, that, that you know, she would groan or, you know, like say, oh, you know, this is awful. She was apparently some some critics even even uh, complained. Uh, that oh, they, my God, that's incredible. Oh, I had wow. no idea. You know, but that's 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 probably another book, another another story. Uh, Michael, this was uh, such a pleasure, and uh, I bet that you are already waiting for the new uh, for this year's ceremony. I will be reading your coverage. I guess all of us Oscar nerds will be following your coverage and your live tweets, which are also delightful on the Oscar night. And uh, thank you so much for writing this book, and thank you so much for finding time um, for this conversation. Well, I definitely will be there. I'm my tux is ready to go with me to the show. I'll be up in the balcony and I'll be covering it for the New Yorker. Um, I actually am going to be taking over the New Yorker's Instagram account on Oscar night. So you can follow my journey along. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for having me on. This was really delightful. And I am also thankful to, you know, the um the the Polish publisher for for carrying the book. It's 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 a real honor to be translated into another language and have an audience in Poland. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm really, uh, I'm really so gratified by it. Uh, I'm sure that many, many readers will enjoy it. And uh, the saga of the Oscar continues. So in a couple of years, 
uh, we will all hope for a sequel to the book as well. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, have a wonderful day uh, and uh, hopefully uh, talk to you again soon. Thank you. All right. Thank you. So long.